Don't call her cute. Don't call her feisty. She's a rebel. She is nasty. She is brave. She is a honey sweetie sugar pie baby. And don't you ever say that she was well behaved. Don't you ever say that she was well behaved. And don't you ever say that she was well behaved. Okay. okay, wait. Can you turn me up a little bit? Damn, uh-huh. We keep doing that. I feel like you're trying to tell me something. No, <laughs> no. I don't even touch that's, it. Is that you? Is that me? Taxi, taxi. Okay, okay. Okay, that's that's good. Um, okay, then. How are you? I'm good. I want to know how your 13 mile walk down Broadway oh, was. Oh yeah, it was so fun. So my dad, did I tell you? Did I talk about it last time? Just yeah, because you were on. Like we had to. Oh yeah, kind I was, of like, go so early. Tired. Yeah. Okay. So I woke up. I'm so proud of myself for going. But I woke up and then I left the house like on time and got there. And then my dad and his friend Billy were coming from Brooklyn and their train stopped. So then I just was waiting there. I could have slept another hour is what happened. <laughs> oh, but I hate when that happens. Because the subway is broken and that's why I'm leaving this horrible <sighs> so town. Broken. Today it took me, sorry, to interrupt real quick, no, took, when I it. texted you that I was in Tribeca. Yeah. I, I like, that's where it took that long. Yeah. But the six train took so, I was just going from Canal to Grand Central it took me like 30 minutes because so crazy. the train just stopped for like 10 minutes at every single platform because oh people weren't. God. And then the drunkest woman I've ever seen in my life sat down next to me. What? Was she like, this, what was, was, she, was she like homeless or like, no, no, no. A, she was wearing the most beautiful, elegant fur coat. Mm. Um, and, sunglasses like, she gone to an event like what's going on why no. is she drunk at like seven not even it was like 5 30 5 30 she was sitting she was with this guy in this full fur coat she's like very elegant looking her she's with this guy he sits down they're both drunk he sits down she sits on his lap they're next to me and then she like passes out into me and then they got oh, off God. at 28th street what where were they coming from no clue they got on at I feel like they got on at Astor Place, Hmm. which like maybe they were on St. Mark's doing shit. Why is she wearing like, did she look like fancy or was it a fur coat like in a hip way? I think it was in a hip way. Okay, cool. So then maybe, yeah, maybe they just had like happy hour cocktails at three. I don't know. Good for her, okay, to be honest. Sorry to interrupt you. But no, that's fine. So, t- so okay. So you got there. You so waited I got there for an I had hour. To wait for like, <laughs> I had to wait for like half an hour for my dad. And then his friend was there at another 50. It was like, by the time we left, it was like 10. And he said we were going to be leaving at 8. <laughs> I got there at like 8.50. Like, it was a whole thing. But it was fine. And then, so we, we get off at 225th in the Bronx. And then that's like a stop where you're on the other side of a bridge that like leads you into Manhattan. So mm-hmm. you just like walk right into Manhattan. Is it very hilly? Um, area? There's like, there's uh, the upper part of Broadway is like, there are some inclines for mm-hmm. sure. You they kind of, they kind of hit you. You don't mm. realize they're coming. Um, but you know, it's not, it's not too bad, but there is some like some up and down. Um, just like life, you know? Yeah. Just like life. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty fun. I mean, by the end, my head blisters. I still have like a really (laughs) large blister I can show you. Well, like they weren't so bad, but there's one that's like very big and I don't really know what happens to it. I mean, you walked a half marathon. Yeah, I did. And then the, (laughs) um, and then like, I was, it was just like very, I was very tired. My legs hurt a lot, but it was cool. My dad was happy. Did you see anything cool? Um, we bought, we bought like cut up pineapple in Harlem <laughs> and that was really delicious. And what else do we see? I mean, there was just like all different, it's like the phases of it are pretty cool. Like you start way at the top of Manhattan and it's like early in the morning. So there's like not a lot of people. It's very residential. And then like, it just gets all, it's all different. And then you get to like Columbia and it's like fancy. Mm. And then you get through, you go through Times Square, which actually wasn't that bad. And then my dad and his friend always stop at this bar called PJ Clark's, which is like by Lincoln Center. And um, the guy who was working there, there was like some kind of like deal where you get three drinks for 16 bucks, but it was supposed to be one person. But after we <laughs> told him that we were, we were walking down Broadway, he gave it to like, gave us three That's drinks. Nice. So it was very nice. 
Um, that is such a cool thing. He was very sweet. And yeah, it was great. My dad and, and his friend usually do it in December, which is like more often than not proved to be a terrible idea, partially because it's usually freezing. And also, which it still could have been. We got mm-hmm. lucky. The weather was was pretty good. Um, not like today. Not like today. <laughs> today is very bad. Today my Luckily, eyeballs froze. The kid that I babysit is like had some kind of sickness which i'm like terrified i'm gonna get but i the positive was that we did not have to leave the house much mm-hmm. his mom was like no you guys should just stay here and i was like darn <laughs> <laughs> but uh, i feel like if you do that in december it's just filled with well, tourists that's the thing. right so it's so crowded it's so crowded usually and he's they're just very stubborn but then they couldn't this year in december so they did it this time and it was cool it was great i mean honestly we didn't see that much we didn't see that much craziness it was just like a lot of like this is not a normal stuff. Um, I had a, yeah. in college, I had a sociology professor who... No. Oh, my hey. God. <laughs> Get down. Um, I had a... So- I sorry. Cut that too. Dogs. <laughs> you know? um, I had a sociology professor who... He was this... Um, he was like a black man teaching at Tulane, trying mm-hmm. to teach like social work or whatever. To And his class was like kind of known as an easy class. But he used to take these you know these like rich kids like in new orleans he would take them from one end of ferret to the other oh, just wow. to see like the evolution of it um <sighs> that's a lot which is a lot yeah it was like it was probably even more back then yeah i mean that's now when, there's like a whole section of ferret that's like that's like i feel like developed in the time that i lived there right but that's before so that section used to be like super it was like before yeah. dat dog was open well like there. one block further it's it is it's like there's just that one little like three block thing that's like company burger but this was did you ever go to tux to fire tux where you were around when that was open Mm, i don't know it sounds familiar we used to go there in college because they would have ladies night where it was free to drink and they didn't check IDs and there would be policemen like posted outside to make sure nothing got too rowdy. But every now and then you would just see one of the cops go into the bar and the bartender hand him like a cup filled with alcohol and he would take it and walk back out. So like that was their that was the deal. Wow. But that place ended up getting shut down because too many people get it, kept getting shot outside of it. That's like that place we used to go after uh, the new movement. Iggy's. Yeah. Is it Iggy's? I think so. Yeah. There's like multiple <laughs> I'm so excited to go there on Wednesday. I'm so excited for you. <laughs> um, it's going to be great. I'm but, a little worried about transportation, actually, because that is the big thing, um, mm-hmm. how to get around. But I think the person I'm staying with for part of the time, I might be able to like ask to borrow their bike. Because I, I think that they have bikes, but I don't, I don't think that they use them that much. So I'll ask them. Do you think that now, because I think if I went back to Mardi Gras now after having like lived in New York for a few years I would just be like oh I'll just walk everywhere it doesn't really matter I mean I'm never you shouldn't I I, I hope you wouldn't do that just because at night it's dangerous yeah I mean during the day I walked everywhere during Mardi Gras anyway or like biked or whatever but then at night no way no way no yeah way, no way it's so dangerous it's so stupid to do that yeah it's just not worth it I just feel I mean, like, like you physically could I'm not saying it's like a like stamina thing it's a right. danger thing even like three blocks it's not worth it yeah I guess you're right I, f- I, I don't know I wonder if like what I would want to see the statistics on like what the chances are of something happening to you, if you hey stop if you walked versus like drunk driving over Mardi Gras getting into that kind of an accident well I wouldn't be doing that either I would either ride a bike or I would get someone to give me a ride right, but other people are yeah I'd say honestly everyone drives drunk in New Orleans all the time I'd say your chances are terrifying oh my god it's so much less terrifying to me than being like arm robbed or raped which happens all the time look at the statistics for that New York is a safe city honestly New York is a city for pussies now it's like you look at the crime stats here and it's like okay I don't disagree at all I would just want to see the numbers on it's kind of like it's like when people are afraid to fly um, but it's actually more but dangerous. But it's so much car. safer than being in a car. Yeah, but I think the thing is, people are not afraid to walk around unless they are from New, unless they like lived in New Orleans. Sure, like, people visit New Orleans all the time and walk around. You're right, and also like thinking back on it, it's like, oh yeah, I remember every year there was a story of one of my friends something yeah. happening to them. Yeah, it's just on New Year's like Eve and Mardi Gras and just everything and, and every I mean, day. Yeah, I mean that's why the best option is bike, really. Mm-hmm. With a helmet and like Hopefully. lights. 
Yeah, you wear a helmet when you bike in New Orleans? Yeah, I okay. did. My, my mom's listening. She's going to freak out. I always <laughs> did. I truly always did. The only too. time I didn't sometimes is if the wig I was wearing wouldn't allow it. Mm-hmm. But that was pretty rare. I only had one wig that really like was huge. And then other than that, I would. And I think all the wigs I have now will be fine. So I might have to bring a helmet. I'm going to ask my friend if I can borrow her bike and if I should bring a helmet with me. Yeah, I used to not wear a helmet in New Orleans just because it's like so hot and sticky. And then I started biking to work every day. And my boss was like, do you wear a helmet? You worked for like a health center. Yeah, <laughs> and a very caring boss. He yeah. got a bike rack there for me. Oh, um, yeah, I, I started wearing a No, helmet. I always wore a helmet. I think after I biked across the country and like someone died on a different trip, I was like, <gasps> yeah. I mean, not that the help, helmet helped them, I guess, but... You know, um, I, yeah, no, I always wear a helmet. My mom, like, for some reason, always thought I didn't, but I always did. I'm, I'm like, a very neurotic person. <laughs> I always wear a helmet. Like, there was, like, a couple times where I, yeah, like, if, the, if it didn't fit over the wig and it was just going a little bit, a couple times. But almost, but other than that, always. So that's probably the best option. I don't know. Or they that's have Uber so and Lyft now, you know. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it, it's just, like, traffic is so fucking crazy, though. I, I mean, I'm or just sleep up. wherever I am. Like, I'm just not going to walk. That's just not an option for me. Yeah. I'll figure it out. No, that's good. I think that's very smart of you. Yeah. So excited for you, because I know you. what Mardi Gras means to you. I'm so excited. It's not the same as what it means to me. <laughs> I always loved, though, like, the month leading up to Mardi Gras. Right, pre-Mardi Gras. That, stuff. like, those par- like parades, I stuff. loved those. Yeah. Yeah, and the smaller St. Charles ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are fun, too. I like it all. Yeah. I like it all. I gotta <laughs> say, I'm so excited. I just spent so much money on, like, uh, costumes. <laughs> I think I'm going to be, for Mardi Gras Day, I'm going to be, like, a cotton candy queen of some kind. What color lipstick are you wearing for it? Light I don't blue? Know. Yeah, I think I'm going to do light blue and pink. I'll kind of mm-hmm. makeup. I got, like, feathery pink eyelashes I got this huge pink puffy wig and then I'm gonna wear like a pink fur jacket and a and a blue crop top and then some like pink leggings and it's gonna look amazing yeah and then I'm just gonna do my makeup and and that's gonna be it and all and then I'm gonna make a crown out of like um you know the just roll paper up to make it look like a cotton candy cone Mm. and then make like a crown out of them yes that's so good. I'm so excited about it. That's like one year in New York when I was asked to like host a Mardi Gras show and I got so excited I and I pictures. dressed up. I looked great and then nobody showed up to the show and I got so depressed. <laughs> and then we ended up just combining it with the, there's like a drunk spelling bee show mm-hmm. that um, like Jake Flores and them host. Yeah. And they were so nice about it. They were like, do you want to just combine since like we only have a couple Aww. people and you only have a couple people. They were so nice and I was so bitchy because I was so sad and Aww. like depressed and upset and I was like, yeah, I guess. <laughs> and then I apologized profusely afterwards to them <laughs> and they understood. But yeah. honestly, I don't think they even noticed. <laughs> so like, we're used to women being mean to us. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, that's really funny. Uh, um, wow. Um, oh, another thing I wanted to tell you. Yes. Um, I listened to Las Culturistas podcast. Yeah, isn't it so good? It's so good. I know. And it's I, like amazing. It's, I binged it. I, I know. I'm, I'm watching a lot. I'm listening to a lot of them from the beginning. They're so fun and their chemistry oh is so good. Well, because they hosted the show that I did um, a couple of nights ago. Which one? Uh, Club Coming. Oh my gosh, Catherine Cohen go? show. It was so fun and it was so weird because I didn't. It's like cabaret and burlesque and comedy, and everybody sang a song except for me, <laughs> pretty much. Um, me and Christy Cello were the only two who didn't sing. Amazing. Um, but they but your sang. Your voices are so melodic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think I went up there and I was like, I can only sing in Hebrew. I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> you should have done that. <laughs> no, I'm not just going to like lead the minion. That would have been <laughs> so funny though. Because there's something about that like haunting scale that sounds good in my voice. <laughs> and like those notes are natural to me. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> but they sang um, Love is an Open Door from Frozen. Oh my God. And Bo and Yang hitting those high notes was oh, beautiful. inspirational. Beautiful. <laughs> and then they sang Hamilton. Oh my God. Um, it so was sad. I should have gone. When was that? Uh, like three nights ago. Damn. Maybe? I just I think forgot it was Wednesday about night. it. 
darn it it was truly magical and i loved it so much and also i'm like a little attracted to matt because he looks like um john mulaney (laughs) and i'm very attracted to john mulaney (laughs) there you go Uh, and it was just and now i have i love listening to them so thank you for planting that seed and i'm sorry if i was like I don't know. Uh, no, time. you weren't. Okay. Maybe that's what you thought in your head. Yeah, probably. Because <laughs> I'm always like, oh, a new podcast. No, but theirs is older than ours. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm full of shit <laughs> all the time. Oh, my and God. And it was wonderful. You don't, you don't show it, though. It's all in your head. Oh, like, that's I good. had no idea. I was just like, oh. Um, well, that's great. I'm so glad you did it. And I'm glad the show went well. Me too. That and I really fun. recommend that anybody listen to Last Culture East. Yes, yeah, I know. Because like, I don't even really care about most of that pop culture stuff, but they care. And the way that it's they so talk funny. about it is enjoyable. They're, they they make funny. me, I, they truly make me laugh out loud. Yeah, I listen to, I've been listening to it while I work out, which is like, I, there's not a ton of podcasts I can listen to while working out, but that is one because it's like so distractingly funny. That and Bitch Sash, which is the Real Housewives breakdown show, are also those two make me laugh out loud. And mm. so they that's what I like kind of although it's a little difficult to be laughing while you're working out, but at least it's like very distracting. Yeah. It messes up your breathing a little. Yeah. <laughs> but it's fun. Uh, uh speaking of podcasts. Yes. You're listening to Well Behave. I'm Molly Rubin Long. I am Ariel Elias. And this is a podcast about women you probably haven't heard of before. From history. From history, baby. And if you hear the occasional barking, that's my dog Bamford, who just turned six yesterday. Wow, happy birthday. She's really uh, she's really unaware of it all. Oh. That's amazing. I'm going to do something really quick where I listen to the pronunciation of a name because I realize <laughs> I did not. Oh, know I think it. I go first this week. Okay, good. Right? I think so. Yeah. Um, okay, so my thing this week, it's not really a person, it's more of a group. Um, it is the Pack Horse Library Initiative. Just real fun. That sounds truly boring. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I think if you kind of just like didn't delve into yeah. it at all, it would be. <laughs> but um, it's like library initiative. It's like <laughs> we're gonna have we're gonna have story time on Wednesday. Yeah. Is that, what do you think it is? <laughs> library initiative. The Pack Horse Library Initiative. Pack Horse Library Initiative. I'm assuming Pack Horse is like the name of a place. Is like a is a uh, proper noun. Molly. How wrong you are. What's about horses? It's literally about horses. It's literally about horses. A library via the horses. What? Oh, pack horse. I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. A pack horse, like that carries things. It's a system of people. Okay, I'm going to guess. It's a system of of people who've organized horses to carry books around. Okay, you're pretty close. And what era do you think we're talking? Um, Probably like, you know, prime horse era. (laughs) The, the old horse <laughs> horse times um so whatever like but like pre, you know pre-car time so like 18 um, 1850s okay well let's get into it i'll just All tell right. you i'll tell you what it is thank you so um this is more the 1930s we're talking depression era but we're also talking in kentucky which okay. is any time as prime horse time in kentucky you know <laughs> Uh, That's what they say. <laughs> Any time is prime horse time in Kentucky. My hometown of Lexington, Kentucky, is the horse capital of the world. Wow. So, um, and where I'm I went surprised to that no one's used that as a roast joke for you. I don't think you have too. a horse-like face, but like that it could it, all white women kind of do. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Well, because. Nobody's used that as a roast joke to me. One, because I stopped doing the roast. <laughs> but two, because I was horribly sexually harassed. But two. <laughs> <laughs> LOL. But uh, it's really. Uh, you great know, time to be a woman men in comedy. Men have careers. It's great. Um, but two, it requires research <laughs> to just like find yeah, that to, out. Like, Google. And Google not everybody it. wants to put in the work like you and I do, I know. you know? So, okay, in the 1930s, education was seen as the way out of poverty in this country. Mm -hmm. And now it's just a way to get into mountains of debt. But (laughs) back then it was like, you know, that was how you would improve your lot in life. Mm -hmm. Uh, But education wasn't a given for a lot of kids because like in rural areas, these kids would drop out of school pretty early because they would have to go help on the farms or in the mines or just like earn a living for their family or whatever. Um, And then when the Depression hit, 
people like a lot of the mines closed like farming kind of like halted like people were getting paid trump to open them back up i know (laughs) (laughs) um and you know like farmers are getting paid to not work the land like shit like that so Mm. uh everybody is real poor and real hungry and fdr uh franklin delano roosevelt in case you didn't know um oh i know i know you know um (laughs) i know that little guy real well i don't know what that means (laughs) i'm not even drunk (laughs) (laughs) you're drunk no i said i'm not Uh, (laughs) you're the one drinking i know um this bourbon is very good by the way uh so from you know Kentucky. So FDR is basically just like fuck. Like I don't know what to do, or like like what do we do? How do we get these people back in work? And um, so he comes up with the New Deal, obviously. Mm-hmm. And Eleanor Roosevelt was like, "Don't forget the women," because <laughs> hey, hubby, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't forget the women. Um, My impression of Eleanor Roosevelt. Hey, that's pretty, is, is, that, is that what she sounded like? Hey, Franklin. Can you can you remember that women are people? That's I her. bet it was way less gentle. <laughs> I bet it was like Franklin. Don't like, forget Franklin. the women. <laughs> this is Eleanor. Franklin. I'm gonna go hunt. Let me teach you how to eat pussy. <laughs> uh, we're oh both God, cheating on each other with women. I swear to God, get the. Hey. Leave her alone. She guys, she I'm not like an dogs. animal person. She's just not a dog Sorry. person. Like She's when a I New want, Yorker. You know, it's like when I want them. No, a lot of New Yorkers love dogs. I think a lot of New Yorkers are just lonely. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so at the time, like all of these infrastructure programs that FDR was putting into place were for men. And like, I think we still see that today. Like this idea of construction jobs or building bridges. It's like, that's man's work. And I still get very excited when I see a female construction worker oh God, doing a project. so rare. And then most of the time they just have her directing traffic. And I always want to be like, do you want to be doing this? Or did they make you do this? Right. You should ask her next time. Maybe I will, but That'd I don't want to be, be cool condescending. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. So as part of the New Deal for women, New Deal for her, <laughs> um, FDR created the Pack Horse Library. A new Deal. Schnoo Deal. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So a New Deal for women is like 50% off at Sephora. It's Am I right? <laughs> new Deal for women is like 77% of yeah. a New Deal. <laughs> So he, so yeah, the Pack Horse Library Initiative was basically a traveling band of librarians who brought reading material oh God, to cool. rural communities. <laughs> um, and they were made up of mostly women, which like I don't think was necessarily by design, but that's just how it worked out. Yeah. And they were mostly in Kentucky. Um, there's this one quote that I found that described those women. The Kentucky Pack Horse Librarians were tough. They had to be in order to travel atop horses and mules over the rockiest terrain through all kinds of weather, carrying books and magazines up and down creek beds named Hell for Sartan, which maybe that's supposed to be Satan. <laughs> I don't know. Sartan. That's a, <laughs> Hell for Sartan. Which show you say that, Satan in Kentucky. Yes. <laughs> there it is. Troublesome and cut shin because of their treacherous natures. <laughs> So these mobile librarians would basically, they would ride out on their mules Mm -hmm. uh, at least twice a month. Each route, hold on. Excuse me. Each route covering, uh, that's for Eleanor. Um, Each route covered uh, between like 100 and 120 miles of like mountainous rural terrain. And if they didn't have a horse or a donkey of their own, they could like lease one from a neighbor. They made... $28 $28 a month and they treated this which I think I looked it up it's like a little less than 500 in today's money okay. so not so that not great. much no um, probably not livable wage I think back then it probably was maybe it was like Kentucky. an additional yeah yeah it's you actually know? probably a livable wage <laughs> <laughs> it still is depends where you are it is insane like I when I went home last time just like going over to my friends houses where they live now and just being like, so how much do you pay for this? Yeah. And it's, <sighs> yeah, but it's then the insane. house is in Kentucky though. The house, it, like there's always a trade off and put it somewhere else. There's always a trade off. That's the problem. I know. I know. Um, so they, most of these women would treat this job like delivering the mail, which means that they took it like very seriously. Yeah, like that male, that male lady that, that, 
Remember that cool uh-huh. Mary? Mary Fields? No. Mary. One of the Marys. Uh, the tall, yeah, she, one of the many Marys. <laughs> so many Marys. <laughs> Don't name your kid Mary. It's very corny and hacky. It's Mary corny and hacky. Mary corny and hacky. Very Mary. <laughs> Mary Berry from British Bake Off. I love that show. Here we are. We're just, we're going to associate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The, everybody's favorite improv game. <laughs> Um, so, uh, one woman used to joke that like her everyone's favorite improv game is no improv game. Oh, shit. Oh, bah, bah, bah. Once again, the shade is real. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. I did improv too. We all make mistakes. <laughs> um, so one woman used to joke that her horse had long legs on one side and short legs on the other so that it could climb up and down these steep mountains. Oh my God. Yeah, I don't love that. That makes me very nervous. See, I like to wear a helmet. I don't want to be climbing up mountains on a donkey with books, with books and magazines, and magazines, and magazines. No I mean, way. you gotta have your people. Yeah, you gotta have your Vogue. Yes, your Must- Teen Vogue. Mm-hmm. Your Seventeen. Mm-hmm. Your Cosmo. <laughs> your uh, your horses. Power Beat horses also. magazine. <laughs> uh, mane oh, yeah. and tail, not yeah, just yeah. a shampoo. Yes. Um, Better Homes and Gardens. All the magazines. Something to read while you shit in the outhouse, you know? Yep, yep. So another woman was writing her bag full of books and magazines when her donkey died. So she walked the rest of her 18-mile route to deliver the the books. So, like, they're very dedicated. And in eastern Kentucky in 1930, 31% of the population was illiterate. Wow. So, like... A lot of people. That's that's a lot. Um, and then my page just moved in a way that I didn't want it to. Okay, oh, wow. here we go. Um, in 1935, <laughs> there was one book in circulation per person, but the standard, like according to some like library associate association, whatever, mm. is five to ten books per uh, person. Okay, so it's sort of like what you want so you can have some choices some you options choices. yeah different stories fiction nonfiction. Mm, i heard of them thriller mystery mrs tree okay miss injury okay uh the state of kentucky was like super like extra hard hit by the depression partly because like their main industry was farming and coal mines and they're also these- like in kentucky so they're depressed yes Yes, yes, yes. Um, well, and that is like a thing that one of the articles that I read said was like Kentucky already was kind of shitty. Yeah. Just in terms of like standards. Um, mm. Like electricity took longer to get to Kentucky. Everything takes longer to get to in Kentucky. Right. They're all dressed like Britney Spears. Dude, yeah. I had a. Right now. I mean, not to not to like tell my tweet on our podcast but i'm going to because it was oh i I think very underappreciated i know which one but it was uh so kentucky just had a school shooting which Mm -hmm. is very tragic and very very sad um but my tweet my joke was that kentucky has had two school shootings ever um wow we really are, are we really are 20 years behind the rest of the country i already read that but I think it was good. It's not for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Not um, only did you tell your tweet, you stumbled upon I your I really t- messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> was it worth it? To me, it was. <laughs> okay, if it Look, if it gets one more fave, Follower. look, then it you was worth what, it. You gotta get that. You gotta get them followers. Get them faves. Get them RTs. I will say, tweeting out a joke every day of the month of January was... I didn't do one yesterday. But yeah, February. Time to forget all your <laughs> <Stop>. resolutions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Give up. <laughs> Just start die. drinking again. Oh my god. <laughs> I know. I think I'm gonna do a late like I think I'm gonna do a post Mardi Gras like cleanse. Yeah, that's probably wise. Like a month. It's like you don't even have a choice that first week. Your body is just like, get it all out. Yeah, yeah. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. Oh man, the post Mardi Gras shits. So good. Bad. I know. I'm going to be on an airplane. Um, it's gonna be <laughs> <laughs> I know. I feel like the airplane after Mardi Gras must smell, be the oh worst God, smelling it's gonna plane. It's so crazy. Well, I'm, going, I'm leaving on the like Ash Wednesday evening. So I think people will have had like time to okay. clear out appropriately. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So, but so like in Kentucky, everything's real hard hit. <laughs> Excuse what me. Who's that one dedicated to? Twitter. Wow. Blessings. So. 
in addition to everybody being poor or whatever, they're also very isolated because most Kentuckians live far away from one another and they're mountain people. So even when they do go somewhere or visit some, somebody, it's like a project, you know, like yeah. you have to really prepare to go somewhere. There like aren't really roads. There are barely trails. It's like if it rains, you're fucked, you know, like every, like <laughs> yeah. everything's wiped out. So these women, these like pack horse library women became these like reliable visitors to these lonely people, especially if they didn't have any Sounds family. Sounds like an old timey insult. You pack horse library woman. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's like what a spinster, like yeah. another word for spinster. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a roast joke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they didn't know they were all just working for this thing that was actually there people were making fun of them <laughs> yeah same amount of racism oh um so they would also bring news to these people from like the outside and they would like fetch a doctor if they needed to i'm sure they saw their fair share of dead bodies because i feel like you know you're just coming to visit these old people it didn't say that in any article i'm just speculating wildly like, i'm sure i'm sure um, but because like all of these people in Kentucky were isolated, uh, they were like very suspicious of these strange women who were showing up with books, you know, these like Witches. these heathen-y books yeah. for their kids. I don't need no books. Fanford, stop. We're recording a podcast. It's like you don't even know what that means. Um, <laughs> so... In order to gain the trust of these like local Kentuckians, the librarians would bring Bibles and stop. And then they would they would like read from the Bibles. So the passages that they would read would be familiar to these people because they had learned it from oral tradition. Mm -hmm. And they were like, oh, shit, like you can just like read the Bible. That's like crazy. And then started to trust them. So then they became like more and more eager to read stuff like for kids mark twain was really popular local kentucky boy um local native mark twain and then they'd read pretty much anything because like for most of these kids it was the first time that they had ever had access to a book and then the idea of getting a new book every two weeks was like thrilling so exciting oh my god this, this you okay you got a no, dog on no, no 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 you're not eating my shoes <laughs> or Buddy. someone will be buying me new shoes Buddy. Buddy. okay I don't have money like that <laughs> um so i think this was like the the pack horse library initiative supervisor god damn it hang on i'm gonna pause real quick yeah okay all right okay so then um yeah according to like some supervisor I uh, said, bring me a book to read is the cry of every child as he runs to meet the librarian with whom he has become acquainted. Not a certain book, but any kind of book. The child has read none of them. <laughs> so, and then uh, <laughs> this child is dumb as hell. And now like, I'll make him not dumb as just, hell. You know, just un ed uneducated, <laughs> just starving for books <laughs> and food. <laughs> Um, mm. And then, like, since funds for new books were limited, these librarians had to get creative. So they started cutting up old greeting cards in order to encourage people to use bookmarks instead of dog earring because it would, like, preserve the book yeah. for longer. They would, like, That's do... That's why librarians are so obsessed with bookmarks. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I love a good bookmark. <laughs> I've never held on to one for very long. Louis has a very funny joke on his album that's, like, about how one night of Hanukkah... He got a bookmark, not even a book to go with said bookmark. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine the book. <laughs> um, and then, like, once these books would fall apart, these librarians started creating scrapbooks and binders out of the pages so that even if, like, you couldn't read the whole book, you could still read passages from it. That, that sucks. Just a bunch of cliffhangers. <laughs> <laughs> like honestly would rather have nothing than just a unless it's like Moby Dick in which case that's the best way to read it <laughs> is to b not barely read it have you ever tried to sit down and read that book no I don't really read a lot <laughs> and I've been reading a I've been reading a graphic novel slowly mm -hmm. and mostly watching reality TV mm. so here we are I listen to a lot of podcasts that's where I become smart yeah that's where you get your education yeah. your information and I guess college, too. I did read in college. But I don't know. I do have, like, an inkling right now to read all the Harry Potter books again. Do that. I don't think that that, like, counts as reading. Yes, it does. Okay. All right. It absolutely well. does. That's, like, 
Don't let these elites. Thank you so much. Tell you that that doesn't count. I know. Well, because I go to the library so much with the kid I babysit. So I decided to get a library card because I hadn't gotten one yet. And so I like signed up online, but I have to go and like get it in person. But then I think I'm just going to like take out all the Harry Potter books. Not at once. You know, I'll do one at a time. Yeah. One at a time. Anyway, this isn't that exciting. (laughs) No, I want to. I only read the first four. I read them all. Like I, I read the first one in fourth grade and the last one, my freshman year of college, they literally were like, they spanned my childhood. Yeah. Um, I really want to go to Harry Potter world though. Oh my God. So much. Wait, I want Bamford died. Guys, can we go to Universal? I think before that. Okay. We should just go and we should go, we should have Liz McGee take us. I know that's like a Lost Cultures thing. They also go to Orlando and I was like, I love, I bet the flights are so cheap, but then it's expensive once you get there. Yeah, but we could stay at Liz's, like oh at Liz's God, mom's. Yeah. Liz's we, mom also works the there. Thing, oh, does she, could she get us pass? I think they could, she, we could at least get in for very cheap. Oh, oh my God. <gasps> Let's go to Orlando. Because that's what she and Jordan did was they just oh like took God. some uh, marijuana espresso beans and walked around Disney I World. I recently went to a Disney theme park with someone who took an edible. They shall not be named for criminal reasons, <laughs> but... I don't like edibles, so I didn't. But I still had such a good... Did I tell you I went to Disneyland? No. I went to Disneyland last, like, on Monday of last week or whatever, when I was in L.A. And it was super fun. And the person I went with, who's very obvious, but I feel bad, like, saying that they smoked weed. Whatever. You can guess who it is. Um, (laughs) um, They had, like, a hookup, so we got in for free. And it was so fun. We had such a good time. And I, I didn't, I didn't take any edibles, but I like had such a good time. So I think I would just go. Oh God, that sounds so amazing. I, I want to go. I want to so go to Harry badly. Potter World so badly, though. That is something I want to do so bad. And they do have one in in California, but apparently the one in Orlando is way better. Yeah. Oh my God, I wanna go I've so never bad. been to any Disney <gasps> anything. What? I know, and I it's really want to go. Oh my god, wait! If you and Liz want to plan a trip, like seriously, I want to go so badly. Yeah, I think we should go. I think we should oh set up god. some shows in Orlando. I think we should. Do they um, have shows there? Yeah, they have a comedy oh, yeah. festival there, which I don't really care about doing the festival. No, but if you listen to this shows. and you live in Orlando. <laughs> Um, come to our show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll talk about. This okay, yeah, we will. Okay, podcast. so um. So anyways, uh, this is when also like churches and schools started turning themselves into having like more permanent libraries because they would donate space for these books to be kept. And then the librarians would come and pick them up from them. Um, And then it by the end of the program, the Pack Horse Library in 1936 alone, the Pack Horse Library Initiative served 50,000 families. And by the time the program ended, they had reached 1.5 million Kentuckys. Kentuckians. (laughs) Kentuckians. <laughs> Kentuckians. 1.5 million Kentuckys. <laughs> Too many Kentuckys. That's an episode of Black Mirror. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Just 1.5 million Kentuckys. There's like, okay, there's like some technology <laughs> that can clone a whole place. So imagine if technology was bad. <laughs> can you can you stretch your imagination that far? <laughs> imagine if technology made people do bad things. Wow. But does the technology make people do bad things oh, or does you, it allow people to do bad things? Have you finished them all now? No, I've only done I've still only watched the first three. I was thinking about this earlier. Oh I've God. still only watched Ariel, the first three I'm because I'll spoil them all for you. Please don't because I really <laughs> want to watch them. It's just that the only time I have time to watch TV mm. the last few weeks has been before bed and I can't watch Black Mirror before, before bed. bed. I I ha- it, it has to be it, like Top it. Chef or The Good Place. Something light. Or something Another fun. Period. Have you watched that show? I have watched some of it, yeah. I love it. It's really funny. It's so funny. It's so good. It's right up our alley. Yeah. I'm almost done. Um, in 1943, the Works Progress Administration shut down because like jobs came back because the war was booming, baby. Booming. Um, but the legacy of the Pack Horse Init- Library Initiative lived on. Um. Carl D. Perkins was a teacher in a one-room schoolhouse in Knott County, Kentucky, <laughs> and um, had like benefited from this from the li- from the mobile libraries. And so he ended up becoming a congressman. And in 1956, he authorized the first federal funding for permanent public libraries, which specifically provided funding for bookmobiles, which I think we've talked about on this podcast before. But yeah. like, you know. Um, that was like a big thing. And to this day, Kentucky still has the largest number of bookmobiles in the country. Wow. So it's always been like, you know, 
it's the only kind of car they have there. Wow. No, that is not fair. <laughs> we have horse-drawn everything. Oh, my God. So that's the Pack wow. Horse Library Initiative. That is great. I loved it. Um, all right. I'm going to go through mine because I feel like we're a little long and we do have to record another one after this. Um, but... My oh wait my source oh yes yeah. source it up baby I'm gonna source it up oh and I found out about it because do you remember that woman who wrote Water for Elephants who we met at the Women's yes. March last year she came up on my timeline for some reason I think she did had, you like, ever a- reach out to her no was I supposed to I don't know I feel like she like loved you and Liz you guys were like ch- really chatting and I th- wasn't she well, like we went through like up? something traumatic we went through something really crazy together that was um, so weird which maybe we'll tell that story on the next podcast Good. okay look forward um, to it but so sh- I, she came up with my timeline and I was like oh yeah Sarah and so I just like clicked and somebody had shared like a story about this um, so my sources were uh, the Water for Elephants authors Facebook page um, History Daily The Living New Deal which I, uh, Herald Leader, which is the Lexington newspaper, mm. and the Smithsonian Magazine by Eliza McGraw, which is where I got most of my information. So cool. that's it. Okay, your awesome. Turn. Okay, um, the woman I chose this week is Audrey Lord. I think both of the women I chose for this episode and next episode are like probably more famous than I give them credit for. But again, the cr- the criteria was just like I'd never really heard mm-hmm. of them. I don't know who she is. So Audrey Lord is self defined as a <laughs> black lesbian mother warrior poet. And Hang on one second. I'm okay. sorry. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> it's okay. Everything's crazy. Everything's crazy. So I thought I would open with one of her poems. Um, Wait, I'm sorry. Can you tell me what she self described as again? Yes. Audre Lorde self-describes as a black lesbian mother warrior poet. Wow. Okay. Um, So this poem is called Power. I'm none of those. (laughs) Um, Yeah, me neither. None of those. (laughs) Cool. Um, This is called Power. Uh, The difference between poetry and rhetoric is being ready to kill yourself instead of your children. I am trapped on a desert of raw gunshot wounds and a dead child dragging his shattered black face off the edge of my sleep. Blood from his punctured cheek cheeks and shoulders is the only liquid for miles and my stomach churns at the imagined taste while my mouth splits into dry lips without loyalty or reason thirsting for the wetness of his blood as it sinks into the whiteness of the desert where I am lost without imagery or magic trying to make power out of hatred and destruction trying to heal my dying son with kisses only the sun will bleach his bones quicker a policeman who shot down a 10 year old in queen stood over the boy with his cop shoes and childish blood and a voice said die you little motherfucker and there are tapes to prove it at his trial this policeman said in his own defense i didn't notice the size nor nothing else only the color and there are tapes to prove that too today that 37 year old white man with 13 years of police forcing was set free by 11 white men who said they were satisfied justice had been done and one black woman who said they convinced me meaning they had dragged her 410 black woman's frame over the hot coals of four centuries of white male approval until she let go the first real power she ever had and lined her own womb with cement to make a graveyard for our children i had not been able to touch the destruction within me but unless I learn to use the difference between poetry and rhetoric my power too will run corrupt as poisonous mold or lie limp and useless as an unconnected wire and one day I will take my teenaged plug and connect it to the nearest socket raping an 85 year old white woman who's somebody's mother and as I beat her senseless and set a torch to her bed a Greek chorus will be singing in three fourths time poor thing she never heard a soul what beasts they are that was written and uh, that was from a collection of hers in 1978. So I think that just gives you like a vibe. So we're in for a lighthearted <laughs> one. Jesus, yeah. that was amazing. I know. It's really amazing. Her poetry is really amazing. Um, yeah. It's like there's a quote, um, a, a poetry critic named Sarah, where is it? Sarah, Sandra M. Gilbert said, it's not surprising that Lord seems to be choking on her anger. Like that's what yeah. all of her poems feel like so visceral. And so that one, well, like I choking just, is like, such a good word too, because she uses like the imagery of liquid a lot. Yeah. yeah. It's exactly. It's all like, it's so, it's so intense and so honest and so real. Like her poetry is really, really beautiful. I'll probably read another one, but basically, so I found out about her because Jabuki Young White, who's a comedian mm-hmm. who I don't know him personally, but I follow him on Twitter. And, um, 
he he's so posted, funny. Did you see his late night set? Yeah, he's super it's incredible. Funny. You should follow him on Twitter and follow him on everything. He's very funny and very cool. Because that doesn't always translate. No, no, no. He's good in person and yeah. on the internet. Um, but he posted, did a tweet today that was like, or yesterday maybe that was like, um, like Happy Black History Month. Here's, um, like, let's not forget the queer and trans black people who like often get forgotten or something Mm -hmm. like that you know I'm paraphrasing but then he posted four photos and one of them was of someone I didn't know and luckily someone had asked him like who is everyone and Mm -hmm. he he mentioned this one was Audre Lorde so I just was like oh I'll look her up um so she was born February 18th 1934 in New York City to West Indian parents she began writing poetry as a teenager her first poem we said this earlier that was published in 17 magazine um, (laughs) while she was in high school um she had like a weird relationship with her parents according to the way she describes them in her poems um her dad like her dad passed away at some point and her mother and her had a very complicated relationship there's like a lot of talk in her poetry about how her mother kind of repressed um her spirit like her mother repressed audrey's spirit Mm -hmm. um and it's like it does you get the sense from some of her poetry that her mother was not like happy to be a mother and like Mm -hmm. kind of resented it so um but she did not eventually she when she had children she did not like translate it that way she um there's she has a poem called where is it um Oh my gosh, where that's that such a hard quote? thing. Like that is one like for all of the challenges that my mom and I had growing up and like how much we fought and didn't get along, like I will say I always felt wanted. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I never felt like I was Yeah, and it, I mean it's hard to tell cuz it is like the most heightened expression of those feelings. So like who knows if it was like in a day to day if it was better. I I didn't really it seemed like there was like less personal information I could find and more just like you know celebration of her, <laughs> yeah. her work obviously um but anyway she has a poem called now that i am forever with child and she says and this is about the birth of her daughter um i bore you one morning just before spring my legs were towers between which a new world was passing since then i can only distinguish one thread within running hours you flowing through selves toward you so, like, mm. she obviously, like, took motherhood very seriously. Yeah. <laughs> it's also, like, in her title that she gave herself. Right. Um, yeah. So, anyway. It so was part of her identity. Exactly. Um, so, in 1959, she, or, excuse me, she goes to Hunter College yeah. and graduates in 1959. And then she goes to Columbia for a master's in library science. So, another library person, mm-hmm. which is funny. It's I'm a library episode. <laughs> that's funny. My grandmother got her master's in library and science, I think. And oh, really? my mom went to Columbia. Wow. Well, your mom went to Columbia? Yeah, she went to Barnard and then Columbia for wow. grad school. Oh, we both have Ivy League moms. My I mom know. I feel like such a disappointment. Oh, yeah. Sometimes. I'm the least educated person in my family. So is Louis. Louis is the only person, yeah. the only one of his like cousins on his mom's side that doesn't have a master's degree. Yeah, I don't have a... I, my brother has a master's, my mom has a master's, and my dad has a PhD. Yeah. I mean, my mom has a JD and my dad has a PhD. My, me and my brother are both yeah degenerates. Yeah. I have a BFA in drama. So I, think I lose. Although he has a BA in metropolitan studies, whatever the hell what that is. That? is. <laughs> Literally, that's a good question. Um, nobody knows. Um, okay, so uh he's gonna hear this i know what it is patrick don't get mad um (laughs) (laughs) anyway so she uh graduates in 1961 and then in the 1960s she the whole 1960s basically she works as a librarian in mount vernon new york in new york city in 1962 she marries edwin rollins that's right a man so (laughs) we kind of know how that (laughs) we know how that turns out um they have two kids but they later get divorced because she is a lesbian um uh oh right (laughs) that's that's the spoiler (laughs) that's part of part of the title too um that's where the lesbian part a real eleanor roosevelt (laughs) yeah except she didn't stay with him um yeah had a girl but anyway so and also i didn't learn much about their relationship or him i also, don't know i like to think fdr needed her more than she needed him oh yeah i'm sure of that um so in 1968 uh that's kind of like the year that her like her life really shifted like she was just like working as a librarian married with two kids mm-hmm. and then at the age of 34 her first volume of poetry is published it's mm. called first cities and she leaves her job as the head librarian at this school in New York City and 
at one point she teaches a poetry workshop at Tougaloo College in Mississippi, and that's the first time that she's um, very viscerally confronted. I mean, it's 1968, and she's teaching in Mississippi. Yeah, as and a she's black, like from New York, to like feminist warrior right. mother, <laughs> poet. lesbian. So like, <laughs> right. and now like I think at that point realizing lesbian um, poet. So like she's like feeling. It's interesting. So that poem that she wrote that I read at the beginning, Power. She t- she talked about how she wrote that, and she said that she was like driving in a car, and she felt so angry about this boy being killed by a white police officer Mm -hmm. that she felt like she was going to crash into a wall or like crash into a car and so she just pulled over and like wrote it Mm. and so it feels like so much of her work is like she's just someone who you can tell from reading her poetry that her emotions just like exist at the at the edge of her Mm -hmm. body like she just has to like get them out like they bubble up yeah and and she just like yeah she's just like very able to like say like express anger or rage or sadness like she just is able to express these big emotions in such a specific way it's like really amazing the po- like i'm not even like a poetry person but i was reading these yeah, and i was like nobody Whoa, is these are amazing <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean, but these are really 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 beautiful so anyway um but so i think probably that experience like it's interesting because her a lot of her earlier stuff is like love poems and stuff like that Mm -hmm. and then post 1960s it becomes like drastically more political and i think that being in mississippi in 1968 um influenced that to some degree um while she's in mississippi in 1970 she publishes her second volume of poetry called cables to rage which focused on love deceit and family and it was in this book where she first identified as a homosexual she has this poem called martha and it's basically a love Mm -hmm. sex poem to a woman so she doesn't say like i'm gay (laughs) but but it's more subtle than that (laughs) she's just like yeah it's like the time i fucked martha um (laughs) it's like okay i guess we get it i feel like there are Um, so many women who like of this time who fucked a martha oh my god you know what i mean martha just like i think i that came up when I was I started to read this book about Polly Murray who like I will one day do I promise but like I I think she also fucked Martha yeah I will (laughs) don't spoil it (laughs) no I won't um but like Martha's always she's always yeah it's always just like a lady named Martha maybe it's the same Martha (laughs) maybe it's just one Martha who made it her mission like like, hey I'm (laughs) you probably are too let's figure it out um no so uh in 1973 her third volume of poetry is published called from a land where other people live and that one focuses a lot on identity and global issues that was nominated for a national book award Mm. um and in 1975 uh her fourth volume new york head shop and museum that was like it was getting even more overtly political and then she publishes this this major book company in 1976 publishes her next uh collection called coal and that was kind of like the one that jumped her off called coal coal like c-o-a-l like kentucky like kentucky there's so much crossover on this episode wow um so yeah that one you guys it repeats itself (laughs) (laughs) don't worry those who don't learn it are doomed to not learn it (laughs) i thought you're gonna say those who can't do it teach it (laughs) too many things um keep making it (laughs) the end no sorry keep telling me about um so yeah cole was the thing that like made her reach larger audiences and then in 1978 she published um probably like her considered one of her greatest works called the black unicorn and that really like explored her african heritage um in 1980 she published a non she also was like an essayist and she was just a writer of all all stripes yeah um but so she published a non-fiction book called the cancer journals in 1980 um where she talks about her struggle with breast cancer um she had a mastectomy and did not get prosthetics um, which mm. was like I think pretty rare at the time. Yeah. And she there was a quote I read. I, I don't know where the exact quote is, but basically she was saying that prosthetics it deals with the idea that it deals with the idea that like no one else will know, but it's like the act of other people knowing is important because like the act of other women who've gone through this knowing that you can lose your breasts mm. and like still be, you know a person a woman. yeah and a woman is important so that was kind of yeah yeah everything she did like it's so cool I, and this is, it's so crazy to me like the way she talks about the way she talked about things like because she didn't 
she didn't like she didn't let anyone get off easy like she is a black mm-hmm. gay woman in the 60s and 70s and 80s and like and like i feel like she, you know she gave it to everyone like there's another poem here actually i'll just read this one yeah um she sounds so self-assured so, yeah she's still and she like she's a lot of, like some of the stuff because she talks like very strange like strongly to white women in a lot of her poems and like that's it's like uncomfortable to read but like in a way that you're like oh this is important you know yeah and um so this is one of the ones that's like well let's see um which ones let me see better um i'll do this one okay okay um it's called who said it was simple there are so many roots of the tree of anger that sometimes the branches shatter before they bear sitting in netics which i looked it up that's like a like a little place to get lunch okay sitting Thank in you. netics though i didn't know either sitting in netics the women rally before they march discussing the problematic girls they hire to make them free mm. an almost white counterman passes a waiting brother to serve them first and the ladies neither notice nor reject the slighter pleasures of their slavery but i who am bound by my mirror as well as my bed see causes in color as well as sex and sit here wondering which me will survive all these liberations. Hmm. She's like, she like just nailed it. Um, yeah, she, she just like, t- so she did a lot. Of, she basically was like pointing out, you know, privilege and all this mm-hmm. stuff. I mean, and I guess it's like, it, this kind of reminds me of that, the Lin- Lindy West article about Aziz. Did you read that? No. The Lindy West op-ed about Aziz. Basically, her Maybe point. I, did. I don't know. Her point like about I read that, so much about Aziz. Know, that the whole thing was a mess. But her, she made a yeah, more she, interesting point. She than always else. cuts through the um, yeah the muck. Yeah, she had a, an interesting angle on it, which was was basically, especially directed to Aziz. But basically, this addressing the the idea that all these men are like where did this come from like what's like like it's all happening too fast and she's like no there's like a long history of women mm-hmm. talking about this kind of thing and this kind of and she yeah audrey lord reminds me of that but not just with feminism but also with like like the rights of black women specifically in america and on top of that black gay women um and so I, she it just seems like the things she's saying feel so relevant like she feels so not only relevant but like even actually I, I don't know how to explain it like they feel like something that like even pe- a lot of people today wouldn't accept but is like become just like slowly becoming more mainstream but the mm-hmm. fact that she was writing this kind of visceral poetry like this in like the 60s 70s 80s it's like she, you know that was like f- whatever 40 years ago yeah. 50 years ago she's like really putting words to things that I feel like we're still talking about and that are like still not even really believed by most people or like yeah. supported by most people. It's just, really it is amazing. really, it, you, I think you hit the nail on the head. There is like this con- and, or maybe Lindy West did, but this conversation yeah. of like, it seems like things are happening all of the sudden and it's like, no, it's happening all of the sudden for you. But for people who have been paying attention, yeah. like this work has been going on for, it, and I'm guilty of it too. Mm, I yeah, think there's like sure. a similar thing, like as I get older and read more and learn more about like my own privilege and um, like, cause I think for me, there was a point where I was like, where is all of this coming from? That like, I'm just like some like white woman or whatever. And it's like, well, no, there's a history yeah, of it. Yeah. And, and, but she also like, she doesn't give anyone a break. Like for instance, this is a quote from her. It's not from a poem. It's just from, I think it was from like an interview she did. Um, As black people, we cannot begin our dialogue by denying the oppressive nature of male privilege. And if black males choose to assume that privilege for whatever reason raping brutalizing and killing women then we cannot ignore black male oppression one oppression does not justify another Mm. so she's like so like that one oppression does not justify another is like such a beautiful thing to say and yeah she just is like man you know who she kind of reminds me of and i'm not like trying to blow smoke up her ass but like she kind of reminds me of ray sani oh yeah yeah yeah. no she she does like because like ray talks about that stuff a lot and also the way that ray talks about it in such like an honest and like powerful like emotion it's such Mm -hmm. it's just like raw emotion in a way that you like are that's like so impressive like i feel like when i get like i'm just trying to think of things that make me 
angry and upset in like the way for instance that that poem power affected her like obviously that basically those exact same stories all the time but also like all kinds of stuff like happening right now that makes me so angry and so upset and then just the ability to like just like like flow that into something so perfect it's it's just like so crazy like the ability to channel your emotions with your logic to yeah. create the perfect point because that is like what they it's so and amazing, also yeah. reminds me of Florence Kennedy a little bit from yeah. the last episode yeah was that the last episode her two episodes Wait, ago which one was that she was the woman um who did the pee in at oh, Harvard yeah, yeah, yeah. who talked yeah. a lot about like intersectionality yeah and, it does remind me of her yeah. flow <laughs> yeah flow the pee in with flow um but yeah no definitely so anyway she's just super impressive um unfortunately um, you know, she did kind of battle the first wave of breast cancer. And then in the eighties, she published a novel. She, um, she founded a, uh, a, uh, what's it called? A press, a publishing group, publishing company with another woman that was like dedicated to women of color called kitchen table, women of color press. Um, she was like a big advocate for black women during apartheid in South Africa. She's writing everything. And then unfortunately the cancer spread to her liver. And at that point she didn't want to get any more surgery. Hmm. Um, so she decided to kind of do alternative medicine stuff. And she spent the last several years of her life in the Virgin Islands. And on hmm. November 19... It's not a bad way to end it. No, pretty good. On November 19th, 1992, she passed away in St. Croix. Um, so that's Audre Lorde. Yeah. I would really recommend looking her up. She's like really inspiring and so, so good. Um, my sources were biography.com and the poetry foundation.org hmm. and a little bit of this New York Times um, obituary of her. But yeah, the New York Times has great obituaries. Yeah, they really do. Well, my next person, I'm like, use, a lo- use the obituaries a lot. Me too. Um, my next person. Yeah, so that was my uh, my person. That's great. It's kind of a heavy one, but I so good. Know, yeah, but like, Young White's yeah. Twitter, because that's yeah, how man. I um, first thought, you know, saw her and said, oh, I don't know who that is. I'm going to look her up. Great. So, yeah, follow go. him on Twitter. Yeah. And us. My yeah. Twitter, I feel like we don't really like plug our Twitter very often. Also, um, very importantly, please, if you have not, if you're listening to this podcast and you haven't subscribed, if you haven't rated and reviewed us on iTunes, that would be such a big help. Because it helps do that. Like, we're not just saying that because, like, we want you, to, like, we want to see what you think or whatever and we want no. five stars. It helps other people find us. Like, yeah. it pushes, the, it's like this bullshit algorithm, algorithm shit. And I know it's bullshit. And, like, but please, 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 ugh, it takes two I seconds. I hate that that's the world that we live in. But, like, it helps other people find us yeah. and sort of, like, the whole point of this podcast is to learn about people who we didn't know about and to like, it's kind of just like to learn in a fun way. You yeah. know what I mean? So like, if you enjoy it, I bet you know somebody else who enjoys it. Yeah, send and it to them. If you don't, <laughs> you can send it to them or you can just like Leave throw us a quick five stars on iTunes with a little like, it's amazing. Yeah. Something That's quick, it. That's quick truly all you have to do. Quick, um, and easy, it helps. beautiful. <clears throat> Cover um, the roll. Molly, do you have any dates coming up? Um, I don't have much coming. Oh, because you're going to Mardi Gras. I'm going to Mardi Gras. So this comes out on the 5th, and I leave <sighs> so excited on Mardi for you. Gras for the, on the 7th. It's going to be so good. So excited um, for and you. And then uh, we do have, well, that I'll, I guess I'll plug in the next one and this one, but we have an all mm-hmm. female reboot show on February 17th yes, at 8 p.m. at the Tank Theater. It's going to be Oscars themed. Oscars themed. I'm very so excited. I'm writing a check it out. I'm writing a Scarface sketch Ooh. and a Get Out sketch. Ooh, a Get Out sketch. Yeah, I'm I'll intrigued. T- okay, I'll tell, tell you me my pitch mic. after. I got to write them tomorrow. Um, uh, tonight on the fifth, I will be at Munchmore's at 8:30. It's a free show. On Tuesday the 6th, I'm going to be at the stand at, at 8 o'clock. And if if you're, like, in New York and you want to come see me, that would be a great one to come see because it's going to be, like, a lot of... Ugh, I sound like I'll be such an asshole to say this, but, like, it's going to be a lot of industry in the audience. And they are the worst audience because they, like, don't laugh at anything. So if you're a human being and you want to come see comedy, eight o'clock please at come the to stand the 8 o'clock at the Tuesday stand. Tuesday the 6th. Tuesday, February 6th. It'll be great. Um, and that's what I have for this. I'll, I'll go ahead and read my next week's dates. Cause why not? Um, Tuesday, February 13th, I'll be at baby grand in Brooklyn at eight o'clock. Um, 
Valentine's Day at 10 o'clock. I'm going to be at Eastville because my boyfriend and I don't give a shit about it. And I then mean, we're going to be in separate states for the the week before and after. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I, like, who cares? I don't care. He, asked I hate me, it. he was like, do you want anything for Valentine's Day? And one year he brought me a heart shaped cookie. And I was like, yeah, I kind of just want that cookie again. Cute. Yes. Yes. Give we did. Cookie, um, boy. We did like half jokingly. Oh, God, if my mom is listening to this, she's about to shit Stop her pants. Stop listening. No, 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 you can listen. <laughs> Just like don't get too ahead of yourself. But we one day we were like waiting for we got a table at some restaurant and it was like a 45 minute wait. So we went and walked around like some department stores and we went and looked at rings kind of as a joke but also like not really yeah, yeah, yeah. and then the woman asked like we were kind of just like looking around or whatever and he was like I need to know what you want and whatever and then this woman was like can I help you and we both were like <laughs> nope <laughs> <Locked out. laughs> oh, so and then yeah all female reboot also on the 17th I'm doing like a like a mommy and me show at QED at mm. three o'clock so that'll be real fun. It's like you can bring your kids if you have kids. Sounds fun. Um, and that's that's it. And wow. now I got to go record <laughs> record another one. Okay, here we are. We're doing it. All right. You know um, what? Yes. Keep making history.